the boundaries around the agencies from frustrating the ability of managers to manage, but also, increasingly, on any problem that matters, connecting the ability of agencies to coordinate with each other. So we've got that piece that's begun to collide in inescapable ways with the reforms that have been underway for the last 15 or 20 years, and then the, the American approach, which is based on a kind of softer letting the managers manage, liberating managers to be able to go do what it is that they intuitively know what ought to happen, is, has collided with incredible political pressures that has created strong incentives for managers just to keep their heads down, to avoid having their heads shot off in the battle that's going on back and forth. In short, what we have, I think, is a kind of end of reform in two respects. The first is that I think we've reached a kind of end of the logical progression of what we've been working on for the last 15 or 20 years. We've done pretty well, but we've gotten to the point where the reforms that we've launched have essentially gone about as far as they're likely to be able to go. But second, end of reform in terms of understanding what is its purpose. And as we've heard in some of the comments this, this morning, summing up yesterday's discussion, uh, we're struggling a little bit trying to figure out what it is that we're trying to do. What is government's role, and what is government's role in the 21st century, and how are we going to make that work? If it seems like this is a very tough set of questions, there's a reason for that. It is a very tough set of questions that goes beyond the framework that has driven reforms, in my mind at least, for the last 15 years or so. And the reason, I think, has to do with some, some basic issues. That we've had important reforms that have been agency-based that have produced dramatic gains in many ways, but where the problems we have increasingly pay no attention to the boundaries we've created. One of the things in, that I, I love to sometimes to torture audiences with is ask, can you think of any problem that matters that any one organization can control? Any problem that matters that any one organization can control. And that, I haven't found anybody, at least anywhere in the United States and any other audience I've talked to that can come up with any one, just one. And if that's the case, what we have increasingly is a situation where results are going to depend on the ability of agencies to connect, which flies in the face of the reforms that have been effort to try to draw lines around the problems and box them to try to get the agencies to respond more effectively within themselves. Uh, we're collecting a lot of information about what we do, and we're putting lots and lots of information out. But I was at a, at a meeting at the White House not too long ago where one of the very top officials in the Obama administration said, you know, we are collecting and distributing vast and massive amounts of information. But he said, and sort of a whisper, we're not sure that anybody cares. We're not sure that anybody actually reads or uses the information we produce. So there's a sense that the internally generated ideas from government about what to do and what information to try to draw, use to drive it. In an information age where we know that information is important, is being produced without a sense of what it is that citizens can engage with, want to engage with, will engage with. And the White House is in the middle of a very quiet kind of conversation right now among top officials just trying to figure out what to do about that. Information is essential, but they're not sure what information that they can produce that citizens will actually interact with, which sort of gets back to the key question that we're dealing with in this session today. In addition to that, one of the things that I think is, is very interesting is that, again, sort of reflect back on the conversations I had in Australia in 1995. The thing that was really striking about that was there was a big idea called the new public management. And there was literature about that. And there were a lot of people writing about it. There was a lot of intellectual excitement. There was a sense that something really big was afoot. And if you try to look around now and ask yourself, what's the big idea? There's, I think, a consensus that the new public management has done a lot of very important stuff, but that it has run its course, and that the next big idea is, and people are looking for the best seller that describes what it is that it should be or ought to be, and the shelf is empty. There are lots of interesting ideas, but we have at this point the series of important dilemmas and the lack, at least, of any kind of really big idea to galvanize action in the way that was the case for the new public management back when it was initially launched in New Zealand in the late 1970s and flowed out from there. And then finally, and this is certainly the case in the United States, uh, not only do citizens expect action pretty much instantly on pretty much everything, but they don't have much appetite to pay for it. 
There's a sense that government's too big and too wasteful and needs to be shrunken down. Don't, don't cut my program now, understand, because what government does for me is incredibly important. But government is too big in general because it's all this money going to somebody else where the money is being, being wasted. There's this appetite, this dilemma to try to shrink government while at the same time satisfying citizens' concerns. Uh, frankly, citizens are not having a very good conversation with themselves about this, and the politicians are scared in knowing how to try to engage the citizens on this question because nobody wants to tell the citizens that you're being unreasonable, which is, in fact, at the core of what it is that this debate is about because we're trying to figure out what it is that we want government to do. But this question about what it is that people really expect from government and what they're willing to have government pay is a major unresolved question in the United States and, I think, increasingly in many countries around the world, accentuated by the issue of fiscal stress, which means it's not going to go away. We can't grow our way out of this dilemma. And secondly, because the problems of trust, because we're not really sure we trust, at least in the United States, our institutions to resolve them. This uh, really sort of leads me to a, a tough problem. Uh, maybe what we have is as good as it's going to get. Uh, I had a, a conversation with a, a colleague of mine who teaches at Berkeley in California who raised this problem with me. And he said, you know, we, we've got a lot of really tough problems out there. And my worry, he said, is that what we're doing and the way we're doing it, if we can keep doing it the way we're doing it, it's going to produce about what we're getting now. We're not going to do a whole lot better within the current management technology. That, put simply, doing more of the same is likely to produce more of the same within the constraints of declining trust in government and increasing fiscal stress. Now, I'm basically an optimist. Uh, you may not know it from what it is I've just said, but I'm basically an optimist because I think there's a way out of this. But, but I do think that we are at an historically important moment where we are facing some very tough constraints hemmed in on all sides without necessarily having a big idea to drive us and the inescapable necessity to try to find our way through this. And I have a sneaking suspicion that my colleague is right, that I'm, I'm a huge believer in improving customer satisfaction, a huge believer in trying to create better one-stop shops, of integrating government services, and making government more transparent. That is all incredibly important. But we are at the point, I think, on the curve of improving government performance where we're dealing with relatively marginal increases that won't be satisfactory or adequate to solve the problems and the demands that citizens raise for us. Now you're all really upbeat, I'm sure, after that. <laughs> but I think that, that's certainly, I think, the case in the United States. As I travel, I think that I find resonance of that kind of problem everywhere. And it's worth asking ourselves, with what we have now, or is what we're doing as good as it's going to get? Absent continue efforts to try to make changes at the margin, but that really gets down to the fundamental question about what does it mean to engage citizens in government? And what is it the citizens want? And can we give them what they want? Are they willing to pay for what they want? And if we're going to continue doing what we're doing, are we going to be able to do it any better than we are now? I think the answer is no, but there are better ways to try to be able to do it. Because we know that, for example, having citizen forums to frame policy makes sense. Having accountability that's driven through information is important. But there are all kinds of things that hem us in. Difficulty of whether or not the media can find a way to make it news. One of the problems is that there's a real kind of political mismatch in the media-based rewards for good government performance. Uh, I'm sure the situation is different here in Australia, and certainly will be in New Zealand as well. But in America, at least, there's never a headline that says, government delivers mail yet again today. There, there's almost no kind of expectation that there will be public rewards for high performance. Because that's what we pay government for to begin with. And government doing its job is, well, what, what, you want applause for this? But at the same time, if you look at the problems of failures, whether it's BP, whether it's Katrina, whether it's the financial crisis, whether it's the problem of putting out fires, that is all news all the time. So there's this real problem of creating media rewards in this, which then makes it difficult for administrators to feel that it's safe. So, because it's easier in these circumstances just to dig a foxhole and to dive in and wait for the fire overhead to stop before you stick your head up. But it becomes difficult to try to motivate administrators to manage as we know that they need to. It gets to be hard for politicians because it's very hard for a politician elected by citizens to tell the citizens that their actions and their expectations are unreasonable. 
and we're having a difficult time of accommodating citizens' expectations with a government that can't afford all of what it is that had been done, which gets to a last kind of puzzle about can we bring citizens in? Well, we have to, but I think what we have to do is to do it in a different way. And again, I'm basically an optimist, but I want to try to suggest an approach to the, a problem. Uh, this is uh, a picture of a government rat pro program in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, back 100 years ago. Uh, now, for a long time, certainly since the Middle Ages, rats have been seen as a, as a problem. Why? Because not only are they, are they big and fat and ugly, but they carry disease. And so governments, since the Middle Ages and the plague, have had a policy to try to eliminate rats. And here, in fact, is a program from back in 1914 where there was a special rat receiving station in Philadelphia with a rat patrol wagon that would cruise the city picking up rats to try to get them out and away from people. So this has been a fairly long-standing kind of issue. Uh, a more modern version of this is a program that was created in the city of Baltimore in my state of Maryland, which is about 40 miles or so from Washington, and the mayor created something called the Rat Rubout Program. Now, one, first one thing in particular, um, uh, I had a dissertation advisor who talked about the naming the baby problem. If you've got to create a new program, make sure it has a really good name. And I love Rat Rubout, because it's out to rub out rats. And the way this works is that citizens could pick up their telephone, dial 311 to report any kind of problem, whether it's a, a hole in the road or sidewalks are not being repaired, or, Mr. Mayor, I've got a rat. And citizens did. And what the city did was to capture the locations where the rat reports came in. And if you look at that, the maps, you see these dots where the calls came in, but when you got enough concentration, it started to become green, and then got darker and darker where there were bigger and bigger reports of bigger and bigger rats. So what you see here is a map of some key public service problems that the city had to face. So then the next question, okay, we have rats, first point. Second, rats are bad, so you want to get rid of them. Third, people expect the city to get rid of the rats, that it's a government problem and not a private sector problem. And so what is it that you do now? And when I've talked to some audiences, I, I've talked to a group of, of Chinese government executives, which, and they have a very kind of circumscribed notion about bureaucracy. The answer, is, of course, is give it to the Department of Rats. And if there isn't a Department of Rats, then the obvious answer is to create a Department of Rats. But it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that the solution to every problem that involves creating a new agency is probably not a good plan. So the next question is, okay, we want to try to rub out rats, and what would we do? Whose job is it to try to rub out rats? Uh, is it a Department of Public Health? Absolutely. But is it sanitation? Yes and rubbish pick up because rats live in garbage and love it, and if you wipe away the garbage, then you have less food for the rats to live on. It's in part housing because the rats tend to live in abandoned housing, and so if you have too many abandoned houses, it creates places for trash to accumulate for rats to live, and then in addition to that, you have to try to keep the streets clean in the front, you have to try to deal with water, so you're dealing with a different kind of department. Before you think about it too carefully, you're dealing with six different agencies at least. And so the way in which this program worked is that the mayor got each of the agencies involved with a piece of the problem. And of course, you know that the standard story about collaboration, I expect you all to collaborate and say, yes, mayor, absolutely, I'm going to do it, go back to the office, nothing changes. But when the mayor is there taking personal leadership, mo motivated and moved by this data, and says, look, I want this problem solved, it becomes difficult to walk away because the mayor has noticed it's a problem that has to be solved, because who wants to allow rats to, to breed? And effectiveness is measured by whether or not you can succeed in making those dots go away. And the mayor comes back the next month, next month after that, next month after that, with applause if the dots start to evaporate, and lots of screaming and yelling if they don't. And at that point, the motivations for collaboration become clear, because with the dots on the map, it becomes clear who has to be a player, and what they have to do. That in itself has proven to be an enormous transformative piece for trying to do what everybody said, but it has, and I want to suggest in a moment, a kind of transforming role in taking information about government and connecting it to responsibility and accountability. Uh, different example here. The, in the aftermath of the economic crisis, the U.S. federal government 
created an $800 billion program.